This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got some fantastic games on tap across week 14 in the NFL. We have got the Cowboys and the Eagles, Chiefs and Bills with big playoff implications, both in terms of seeding and who will make in the playoffs as well. We're going to break down those games plus others to get you ready for week 14 by talking to Dr. Ed Fang and picking his brain on what his numbers say about week 14's games. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here as I am every Thursday by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work at thepowerrank.com. Check him out on Twitter at thepowerrank. And Ed, didn't get to talk to you about college football this week because we were into the postseason there now, but obviously a very interesting weekend across the conference championships and the playoff selection with Michigan getting the one seed. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, It was nice to see Michigan get a win. It was kind of a weird game against Iowa. Uh, I actually thought they – I thought it was worse looking at watching the game. I thought Iowa's defense played really well, really uh, bottled up a bunch of things that Michigan wanted to do. But then I looked at the metrics and, like, I mean, I didn't really change Michigan at all based on what happened. And then you consider the pretty sure-handed Colson Loveland dropped a couple third-down passes that could have really changed, um, you know, the narrative in terms of, you know, when you were watching the game. So, uh, yeah, obviously all the fireworks happened Sunday. Yeah, all the fireworks happening Sunday with FSU being omitted despite the fact they won their conference championship. They were 13-0, and 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 you understand why, for sure. And you understand why. You understand why FSU fans be very frustrated. You get the argument uh, from their right. behalf. And I guess, Ed, it's a situation where I get every argument here, and I do feel right. bad for FSU people. I, I understand do. people saying they should have been let in because of what they did, but also like right. as a – very selfish, more casual college football fan. I'm a lot more intrigued by Michigan, Alabama than I am by Michigan FSU personally. So I see it from all sides, but like just from like a football watching perspective, selfishly, I kind of did want the committee to do what they did. Exactly. Michigan, Alabama is, I mean, it's essentially a coin flip. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's what the markets are saying. I think that's what my numbers are saying. And it's going to be exciting. Um, Florida State, look, the committee has always talked about putting the four best teams in there, and they've never really put the four best teams in there. But the fact that they've been talking about putting the four best teams in there kind of gave them an out with, uh, you know, I mean, Florida State's not one of the best four teams right now. In fact, they weren't one of the four best teams with Jordan Travis, I would make the argument. Uh, But that's a discussion for another day. You know, they, they they did put the better team in there. So, you know, I guess hats off to them. I understand the frustration with Florida State. I would not be happy if I were someone like Bud Elliott, whose income kind of depends on, uh, you know, a Florida State podcast right. and, you know, interest in that. And then, um, yeah. Anyway, I like I think one thing that is pretty interesting, I, I think we have a lot of people complaining about like 12 team playoff and like, oh, there's going to be a three loss team in there, yada, yeah. yada, yada. But I actually don't hear anyone saying, man, this four-team playoff sucks. Let's go back to the BCS. Let's just have Michigan and Washington in a game. Like, I, I don't hear that. Maybe I'm missing it. Maybe I'm not tr- scrolling my my Twitter screen enough. But <laughs> we're going to get to the playoff next year. It's going to be great. It's going to be, I mean, just a bonanza in terms of money. It's great for my business. It's great for your business, Jim. Right. Everything's going to be good. No one's going to be like, hey, let's go back to four teams. Um, so, you know, we just got to wait out one more year and – it, it's it's going to be fun. You know, this is kind of like my glory week uh, yeah. out of like my entire career doing college football because I've decided not to put too much effort in the bowls. Right. Really just not my strong house. You know, numbers are just not going to be the best when there's so many opt outs and late breaking news. It's essentially become like betting NFL preseason, which is something I don't do next year when the playoff comes going to be really busy this past week uh, getting ready, you know, getting ready for the playoff but this is the one year it's kind of like yeah this this has kind of been a nice week of course uh, a whole bunch of nfl stuff like dropped in my lap this week so (laughs) it's not like i was doing nothing uh but it's an interesting year out of you know the decade past and hopefully decades future that that i do college football it's an interesting year like the 12 team playoff like i get 
you know, again, I understand why people might not want it and stuff like that. But like, from my perspective, like there were a lot of fun teams that were ranked five through 12 this year. Like yeah. George is a good football team and they it were the sixth really, ranked really team. Like team. they're a really good football team. Do I want to watch Georgia play more meaningful games? Heck yeah, I do. Like, absolutely. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, right. Ohio state, a good football team. I'm assuming if they had been the playoff, Kyle McCord would not have entered the transfer portal at that time. Bo Nix uh, in Oregon would have been ranked eighth. Like, that's yep. a fun setup. Like that's some fun football teams. And like, I, I get it from a, a lot of different angles. Like it does devalue regular season a tiny bit compared to what it is right now. But like those games will still matter a lot for seeding perspective. Like those, those buys for the top four seeds are going to matter a lot. So I, I'm just excited for it. Honestly, I think it's going to be great getting to mo- watch more Brock Bowers and meaningful games. Like, yeah, I think that that's all that's all super positive. So I I'm just pumped for next year. It's a bummer for teams like FSU, but like, you know, we're getting more fun games this year. We're going to get a lot more fun games next year, too. So I'm all in favor of all of it for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, I do get that it devalues some of the regular season games and and Michigan, Ohio State this year was truly special because everything yeah. was on the line for, right. for both these teams. But it doesn't mean that people aren't going to watch it next year. It's still right. going to be a good game between two great programs. Right. Um, so, I think I think I think people like to complain about a lot of things. Um, I think next year is going to be great. It could still mean a lot too. Like if one of those teams, the one loss team, and a, a second loss knocks them out, like knocks them out of the Big Ten championship game when there are no divisions. Like there are a lot of ways those games can mean a lot, even if it's not you know single loss elimination type thing. So. That'll be a whole lot of fun for sure next year. And the more immediate future, we've got some NFL to break down in week 14. And like I said, really fun slate will break down here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts are preview of the banger game between the Steelers and Patriots is already up with Tom Vecchio breaking down his thoughts on that game for Thursday night football that is in the covering the spread podcast feed and the FanDuel TV plus app as well uh tomorrow we're talking to Tom as well for some NFL props Austin Castle swing by to break down EPL uh, match week 15 as well. Getting more soccer on the show. Once again, all right here in the covering the spread podcast feed, the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV plus score early this NFL season with FanDuel America's number one sports book right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks. If your team wins, if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There is a wide range of betting options including spreads, player props, totals, and more. So visit FanDuel and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL, must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. $5 pregame money line wager required. $10 $10 first deposit required bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1 800 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1 888 789 7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700, visit KS Gambling Hotcom in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, visit MD Gambling Health in Oregon, Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming, HOPE is here, visit GamblingHelplineMA.org, or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts, or call 1-877-A-HOPE-N-Y, or text HOPE-N-Y in New York. Now, I mentioned before Thursday Night Football. That's the topic I want to touch on at least partially here, Ed, because looking at Week 14, there are a lot of super, super low totals. It's not just that game, but also the Browns-Jags game total is 31.5 for that game right now, and For most of this year, my model's been able to keep pace with the market in terms of having very low totals. I've had a lot of the lowest totals I've had have been this year. But this week, I'm showing value in a lot of overs. And I don't know if it's like unders just got a lot of steam or whatever it may be. But I want to ask you to kind of get a sanity check here to make sure I'm not losing my mind because I like a lot of these overs. But do you have any interest in betting toward the mean with these outlier spots or... 
is it hard to grasp how bad some offenses truly are right now? Yeah, I think it is hard to grasp how bad offenses are and quarterback injuries are definitely the first culprit. Every Grass came on my podcast, uh, the football analytics show, and I asked him what his biggest takeaway from the season was. And, and he talked about how offensive sucked and, and he, he talked about a lot of different things. Uh, but one thing that really stuck out is that teams are playing light boxes more on defense and offenses are not being as efficient running against those light boxes. So maybe that's noise, but that it, it's, it's an interesting little fact and stuff that I don't think you can look up publicly. I think Edward has uh, access to some NFL next gen data. So again, you know, we're kind of playing the signal versus noise kind of thing. And I went back and looked at some of my numbers and it's not just a decrease this year. It, it's kind of a, a decrease since 2020. You look at how points per game have dropped from 24.7 to 21.7 this season. Success rate has dropped every single season. Uh, we're looking at 42.1% passing success rate compared to about almost 46 yards per pass attempt has dropped too. So it's overall decrease in, in efficiency overall in the passing metrics that I use. Uh, I don't know. Bad ball rate is up too. Uh, it's 12.2% compared to about 11.6% over the last couple of seasons. So there probably is some systematic thing going on with offenses being less efficient. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily just this year with the quarterback injuries. I think it's an overall trend over the last four years. It'll be interesting to see the league changes rules or whatever to, to fix it. I do think there probably is some signal in the decrease. That certainly doesn't mean you shouldn't bend over if, if your model is saying that. Um, but I think the overall trends are kind of pointing down and, and not just the season. Yeah, definitely. And I think that for me, that's part of why I've been okay with having having my model say show value in unders previously is because like, okay, I can project for a backup quarterback and stuff like that. And to this point in the year it was never an issue. It's just like this, this week specifically, like looking at uh, totals for this week, like it's a lot of overs and it's not all overs and low totals. Like I have the over on Seahawks 49ers or 46 and a half. So like that's a, that's a higher total too, but right. It is like the the Jags Browns game. It's gone up a point, so like that is slight validation. I I have the over for tonight's game, which may sound very stupid by the time you listen to this. Um, but like I did take over 30, 30 in that one. So I mean, thirty is just so low, right? You get a it's the lowest in like and... decades. Yeah, yeah. And like defensive touchdowns can happen. <laughs> so like, yeah, you know, I just. I'm having a hard time getting there, despite the fact that like my model knows how bad these quarterbacks have been. I can project Bailey Zappi to be terrible, um, and it's still showing value in the over. But I don't know. It's just it's tough to get there uh, for a lot of these. So we'll see how it goes. But luckily, Ed, we're not talking about those games. We break down games for today. Instead, we're talking about some fun games, beginning with the Seahawks and the 49ers right now. The 49ers are 10 and a half point favorites, and the total in this game is 46 and a half. We just saw these two teams square off back on Thanksgiving. In that game, 49ers took care of business, covered the spread. Uh, they scored 31 points. Can they do so again, given this lofty spread here? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Niners have been really on a heater ever since the Cincinnati game. Over the last four games, they've won every game by 13 or more points. And um, so it's, it's not surprising that this spread would be 10 and a half. And it's not surprising that my model cannot catch up with it because my model tends to assume more regression to the mean. I have Niners by about eight. Um, you know, Seattle is the definition of NFL average. Uh, I had them within a point of NFL average this preseason and both my market model based on closing point spreads adjusted for who you played. And then all the data from this current season, they all say that Seattle's with within a point of, of, uh, of, of NFL average. So let's just assume, you know, they have a rating of zero. This is a division game. So I'm giving about 1.3 points to uh, the Niners for being at home. So you have to believe that the Niners are nine or more points better than NFL average. That's a tall order. I mean, that's that's like some of the best teams that we've seen over the past decade. Could they be one of these teams? Sure, maybe. But, um, you know, this is a big spread. I, I like Seattle plus 10 and a half. Um, I, I I can't I can't quite get there. Seattle's not a terrible team. Uh, the Niners I I just don't think are quite that good. I do think there is some value here. 
And I think there's also a bit of like recency bias uh, because we did just see this game and the Niners covered there. They, I think it was seven and a half was the spread for that game. They won by 18 in that one. Um, and then they beat the Eagles in that high profile game pretty handily right. on the road there. Now they come back home. Seattle's on extra rest. That's a benefit in their favor as well. Um, so there are a lot of factors pointing to the Seahawks in this game. I, I guess like it is tough mentally to bet the Seahawks, given how good the 49ers have looked, but that's kind of the point, right? Like, is you're betting right. against the market and like we have those biases and we're betting and if people are reluctant to bet the Seahawks here, then that may imply there's value in the 49 or there, there's value in the Seahawks because people are reluctant to bet them no matter what the number may be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is just a big spread against, you know, probably not a terrible Seattle team. I think they're, I think they're uh, good. They have a lot of talent, young talent on defense. Geno Smith's not terrible. They have a pretty good set of wide receivers. Uh, not many injuries on either side either. Uh, so uh, it's a game that you can really trust the numbers. Also, Gino in that th Thanksgiving game had that banged up elbow that he hurt on the Sunday before it and then still played Thursday, but then looked really good against Dallas. That was indoors, so that does matter. But this game, I think it's like three mile per hour wins at Santa Clara for Sunday. So not a lot of win to discuss there. Part of why I like the over in this game is that. So I think it should be a fun one out in uh, California. Let's talk now about the Bills and the Chiefs, where right now FanDuel Sportsbook has the Chiefs as very slim favorites, point and a half in their favor right now. Total in this game is 48 and a half, and that spread is tightened from where it was earlier on this week. It was minus two and a half. It's now minus one and a half. Do you agree with that movement towards the Bills in this game, Ed? I think I can make the case for why it's moving that way. Look, Buffalo is probably one of the most talented teams. It really hasn't worked out from there for them this year. Uh, I kind of feel a little bit like a broken record, but we've talked about how bad their defense has performed this year. The 31st, when I look at passing success rate adjusted for opponent, but I really don't think even with all their injuries that, um, that they're that bad. I think they have some decent players in the secondary, um, you know, there's some signs they're 13th when you look at adjusted yards for pass attempt. Success rate is stickier in terms of predicting the future. But, you know, when you have that wide gap, you can kind of I mean, I think they're better, better than that. And I think Buffalo is a pretty good team. Uh, Josh Allen, the offense has been great. They're fourth in my adjusted passing success rate. Um, you know, they have they have all those weapons. But on the other hand, you know, my model has Kansas City by 4.2 points. So I do like not having to bet well, i mean two and a half is fine uh fine number but if you're gonna if you're gonna bet kansas city one and a half is is also good uh with kansas city um there are some injuries isaiah pacheco is uh not practicing although i feel like he should play um you know patrick Mahomes hasn't been great uh so i mean not up to his usual lofty standards right and they did get a little screwed with that pass interference uh, on Monday night against Green Bay. Could have really won that game. I guess they got to convert a two point conversion as well. Um, I mean, if I'd lean any direction, it would be Kansas City uh, minus one and a half here. Yeah, I did take the Bills money line at plus 118 on Tuesday, or I took that on Monday, I think, uh, but then talked about it on the show on Tuesday. And the reason why I was there is because I have this is basically a toss up. I have 49.8% for the bills, uh, which implied there is value there at plus one Oh two. That means there's no value left in their money line right now. Sure. I do agree with you that the Pacheco injury is significant uh, for the chiefs. If he doesn't wind up playing now, the situation for him was he had a run. I was watching him pretty closely because I had him as uh, the, in the MVP slot and uh, my single game lineups. And I had a couple mm -hmm. of, you know, they give you like the bonus bet, same game parlays. I'm not a huge fan in general, but like, hey, it's a, if it's a bonus bet, sure, whatever, I'll I'll right. play my part. Um, and so I had like some of that stuff tied to Pacheco. There was a play where he came off and like he was like, it was I think it was the last play in the third quarter. He like kind of motioned toward the sideline, but then like stayed in the game. I could be totally making that up, but I thought I saw a motion towards the sideline, but then he stayed in. And I'm not sure if that's where it happened. They're calling the shoulder contusion. And I always assume that means he'll play, but not practicing again Thursday is concerning. The reason that that matters is like they, they just been a very good rushing team recently, which they hadn't been earlier on this year. And like it keeps the bills honest. So I, I think that like Pacheco does matter. I still think there's a good shot that he plays like a probably 50% chance that he plays in this game, despite missing practice again. Uh, but like it would be a downgrade not to have him uh, for sure. So 
I don't know. I I like the Bills at plus one eighteen, plus one hundred two. I don't see any value anymore, so I would stay away from it personally. Uh, but I do think that I get what you're saying with the minus one and a half, just as a as a buy low spot on the Chiefs. Um, right. Given that there's kind of some bad sentiment in the betting market around them right now. Right. And I mean, in general, like I mean, my numbers probably. I think they're probably spot on with KC, and mm-hmm. they may be a little bit low on Buffalo. But mm-hmm. I mean, there's a little bit of wiggle room when I have it by, you know, over four points. Right. Exactly. So Ed leaning towards the Chiefs minus one and a half in this one. Let's finish up, though, with the headliner from week number 14. That is the Eagles at the Cowboys right now. Total in this game is 51 and a half and the spread is the Cowboys minus three and a half. And we finally saw the Eagles kind of get punched in the mouth last week. And now they get another tough task on the road. So, Ed, can the Eagles bounce back and cover here or did the Cowboys move into a tie for the lead in the NFC East? Yeah, I mean, look, my numbers have Dallas by about a point, so kind of showing value. But uh, unlike last week when I had value on Philly and I was able to, uh, I don't know, I just thought San Francisco being a favorite at Philly was just too much. Didn't work out. Um, I think I mentioned that I think Philly is overrated. I do think Philly is overrated. Um, I, I, I wouldn't bet this, even though my numbers have it. Uh, I do think Dallas is probably going to get this win uh, at home. Um, look, Philly seven and one in one score games, which is which is kind of crazy. Uh, I actually looked up some of uh, Jalen Hurts' PFF numbers. So he, he he had a PFF passing grade of eighty four last year, and it's only down a little bit to like eighty one. Um, it seems like it should be down a little bit more. But when I was looking at at that, uh, it was interesting to see. We talked about how uh, scoring is down, but you know. Last year, let's see, sorry, this year there are 13 quarterbacks that have a passing grade over 80. And last year there were six. Hmm. So they actually have more quarterbacks that are doing well this year. Maybe it's balanced by the just awfulness of, of some of the lower lower graded quarterbacks. Um, anyways, Jalen Hurts is outside the top 10 this year. That's how I view him as a passer. I, I just don't think he is in the top 10 when we're talking about passing. Obviously, he brings other things to this game. I just think there's a ton of questions with the, with this Eagles team. With Dallas, we kind of wrote them off after that San Francisco game a long time ago. But before that, like we were really pumped about – I think I have a bet on Dallas winning the division. I mean, okay. I like Dallas coming into the season. Uh, kind of sold on them a little bit there in the middle, but they look – pretty good recently i think we're back to where we think dallas is uh you know one of the one of the primary contenders to make the super bowl out of the nfc um i don't know i think the market's fine i wouldn't bet this yeah i'm pretty much in the same spot uh, i mentioned before that i don't trust my one model when it comes to the eagles because because the way of use passing efficiency and they don't grade out as well there the other one actually does have dallas minus four and again that's the one that's a bit higher on Philly. So even that one's showing a bit of value, but it's not a ton, not enough where I'd be willing to bet it. But um, the minus three and a half is actually even money right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. So potentially a bit more enticing there. But again, it's not a big enough, um, big enough gap to, for me to get super intrigued. I think the most interesting thing here is actually the total. So I talked before about how like, you know, I'm seeing a lot of value in overs on low totals. I actually have this one is pretty much spot on. Now it's very hard typically for me to show value in a high total with a decently tight spread because high totals correlate towards larger spreads. So you wouldn't expect to see a high total be a, a fair like number when the spread is tight like this, but I've actually got this total at uh, 51.1. So mm-hmm. what that says to me, Ed, is this game is going to rock because it's, it's a good offensive environment. It is indoors. There is no wind here. So like, that does nothing to you for, for you from a betting perspective because it's saying the market's efficient. But I think the fact the market is efficient, given how high the total is for a game with a tight spread, I'm pretty jazzed about that. So from a, a football fan perspective, right. that gets me excited. Yeah, and it's got the nice Sunday night slot. It should be a pretty good football game. Um, I'm hoping the Eagles can kind of do their best to stay in there and maybe potentially win it. But um, but yeah, I think Dallas is right the Philly favored. I did have one question for you, Ed. When you were looking sure. at Jalen Hurts' PFF grade, uh, this is overall grade, not just passing grade. Did you happen to notice no. the player right in front of him? Uh, I did not. It is Brock Purdy, who I've been told is not deserving of the, the, the MVP award because he, he benefits too much from his environment. 
Although Jalen Hurts is third in MVP uh, odds right now. Brock Purdy's above him in PFF grade. And like, I'm not saying like you should like Brock Purdy should be MVP. I just think it's very funny the way the discourse has dismissed him of like, Oh, his stats are propped up by his, his environment, by his coaching staff, which they are. That's true. But right. like, you know, it's not like he's terrible. I and mean, I think the people kind of take that a bit too far sometimes and like dismissing Brock Purdy just because he has good circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, I mean, it's interesting to think what we'll be saying about Brock Purdy in two years, right? Yeah. Will this just be a blip? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, Daniel Jones came out of the the gate roaring yeah. in the NFL. Uh, he was, he was pretty good when they, when they first threw him out there as a rookie that hasn't worked out quite so well. So we'll see what we're saying about Purdy in the future, you know, whether he's with the Niners, whether he's with another team. Um, that's the fun part about being an analyst. Absolutely. All righty, Ed. Beyond those games, any other spots where you see value across week 14? Yeah, so I, I want to talk a little bit about this Thursday night game because I think you can make the case for uh, some value in Pittsburgh. So what actually has been keeping me busy this week is that I actually reworked my model. Over the summer, um, I was able to figure out – I was able to uh, adopt my algorithm – for making schedule adjustments to account for individual quarterbacks, right? You could say, yeah, you should have done this since the beginning, Ed, but look, I got it done this off season. And uh, finally with all the injuries and with the lack of college football this week, I got around to, to implementing it. And it's pretty interesting because uh, Bailey Zappi is, is kind of historically bad when you, when you look at it, uh, when you get, look, it's only 71 attempts, but, you know, he's predicted to have a passing success rate of 27% uh, against an average NFL defense. The NFL average is about 15%. So, you know, the second worst on this list is Tommy DeVito at 32%. So there's there's a huge gap. And um, when, when you make a number... Okay, so before what I would do when accounting for quarterback injuries would just... Would be to rely on the market model... Um, you get a couple of games and and you get some sense of what the market thinks of that team compared to NFL average. And now I actually have a way of doing a database uh, way of doing it, both through success rate and yards per pass attempt. But when you did it with Zappy, I mean, you, you got something like Pittsburgh by like 10 or something. And so you, and you can argue like if Zappy is going to continue to be that bad, like Pittsburgh, which should be a 10 point favorite, but then you sit back and think, Oh, Pittsburgh is going to be a 10 point favorite with Mitch Trubisky at the quarterback position it didn't make a ton of sense. Right. And so um, you, I actually get about Pittsburgh minus six when you assume that new England is about three. I, I, I use the market value for, for new England saying, ah, okay, we don't have a ton of, don't have a ton of stats on, on Zappy. Let's just go with that. If you assume that they are about three points worse, maybe four, maybe more. I don't remember the number, but that would give you uh, what the market has for Pittsburgh. So I do think you can make the case for Pittsburgh side here, but it's just when you sit back and think about it, it, it doesn't make a ton of sense. So uh, it's an interesting game. I, I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't bet on Pittsburgh here, but I thought it was an interesting thing to talk about for this week. I'm curious what the number said about Trubisky in that sense, because it's a larger sample yeah. on him, but it's also been a pretty long time since we've seen him actually get reps at quarterback. And like for me, when I'm, I don't know if this is wrong, but like I view there as being almost no difference between Pickett and Trubisky. So that's part of why I should value the over here is because like, I don't think it makes a difference. I think Pickett kind of sucks. So like, like right. that's part of it. Why I should value the over there. And part of why I bet Steelers minus six. Uh, so I'm curious what the number said regarding those two. Yeah. I mean, for Trubisky, it's, it's 50 pass attempts, right? And I have right. about 3% better than NFL average when you make the adjustments. But again, small sample size, I don't expect him to be better than NFL average, right. especially with the weapons that they has on that, on that Pittsburgh offense. Um, so I think overall, when you looked at everything, I think Pittsburgh was like exactly NFL average when mm -hmm. you looked at just Trubisky's numbers and the market model with him. Okay. Well, 
putting my money on uh, Mitch Trubisky via the over and via Steelers minus six. What could possibly go wrong? Who has ever regretted having financial implications tied to Mitchell Trubisky in their entire life? That is all that we have here for today here on Covering the Spread. But Ed, a lot of stuff cooking for you over at the Power Rank. What's going on over there and on the Football Analytics Show? I had a great conversation with Professor Edward Egros on the Football Analytics Show. We talked about the NFL and why offenses sucked. Talked about the college football semifinal games. So get that wherever you get your podcasts. And then check out my uh, free sports betting email newsletter. If you're looking for action on any given weekend, this is the free service for you. You can check that out at thepowerrank.com. It's my curated list. Uh, sometimes it's my bets. Sometimes it's other people's bets. Um, but check that out at thepowerrank.com. All right. And find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. You can find me on Twitter at Jim Sonis. I am on threads at Jim Dotsonis. You can find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across week 14. Back again tomorrow to break down some props and some EPL bets. We'll talk to you all then. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 